When it comes to people with profound brain injuries, Terry Schiavo once said, where there's life, there's hope. Hope is the theme of this special two-part episode. You'll meet amazing individuals who defied insurmountable odds and fought their way back to recovery. And you'll meet family members who are with them every step of the way. Stay with us. In May of 2002, Brendan Flynn of Seneca Falls, New York had just graduated from high school and was excited about the possibilities awaiting him in college. But his life was drastically changed when he and a close friend were involved in a fatal car crash that left Brendan in a coma and his parents wondering if he'd ever recovered. I was driving down the road. The lady came from my right. She was doing over 60. She had a yield sign and she ran the sign and hit my car right behind the passenger seat. It split the car in half and threw me and my friend out the back end 30 feet into a ditch. But the neighbors heard the accident and they came out to check on us and I was face down in the ditch and they rolled me over. If they didn't roll me over, I would have drowned. They flew me to upstate um, in Syracuse. They flew my friend to Strong where he later passed away that day. When you got to the hospital, did the doctors give you any hope for recovery for Brendan? What was the prognosis at that time? Oh, poor, very poor. At that moment, they didn't want to tell us that Brendan's friend died because that was the severity of the accident and they, you know, that was their way of not telling us. They weren't sure how we would make it. There was a complication with the feeding tube. It came dislodged yes. and put the food into the area surrounding the stomach. Brendan took a turn for the worst. And I understand that the doctor advised you not to do any corrective surgery. They came in and told me he's not going to make it. He's, full, his, his, he's barely breathing. He was so full of infection, which is the peritonitis and the septic shock. We get, I get to the hospital by my, uh, in the ambulance because they told me he wasn't going to make it. And I faced all the physicians all in the ER. And the surgeon um, looked at it and came in and said, you know, um, Mary Jo or Mrs. Flynn, why put your son through any more suffering? Um, he's not gonna make it through surgery. Then he said, you know, I can put him in a room and we can keep him comfortable, but, but he'll pass within the next 24 to 48 hours and it'll be too late to do surgery and at that point something inside of me was like I don't want my son to suffer and I looked at him and his eyes were open because prior to that he was in the coma and we were trying to get him to respond but his eyes were open I knew it wasn't up to me so I told the, I looked at the surgeon and I said you know we're not God you need to do the surgery you know, and if he dies during surgery, then, then, then that's, but we didn't make it this far. And so, right after the surgery, the surgeon came out and he looked at us and he goes, I don't know how he got through. And I don't think he'll get through this night, but here we are. Brendan's wife, Nicole, had a similar story to share. Having finished high school, she was eager to leave for college with nearly a full scholarship but her plans were derailed by the brain injury she sustained after being struck by a car. Two days after my graduation, I was crossing the road, didn't look both ways, and got hit by a car. Went into a coma and was in the coma for a month and a half. I woke up from the coma. Some say I woke up singing. Some say I woke up talking. I don't know, either way my mouth was going. And then I did brain injury rehab and I was in rehab when I met my husband, Brendan. Rehabilitation was key to Brendan and Nicole's recoveries. After spending three months in a coma, Brendan woke up but had no memory of the year before his accident. He had no speech and limited motor skills, but Brendan was determined to work hard and gain back his quality of life. Well, I remember the first challenge, um, just laying in bed, not being able to move, and seeing the doctors around you, and, and they would diagnose me like right in front of me. That made me so mad. 
And I just thought in my head, I, what, what do I have to do to walk? What do I have to do to talk? And it was just a lot of therapy, a lot of work. And it's not easy. It would have been easy to give up, but you don't give up ever. And they got one life, so the fact that someone wanted to take that from me makes me so mad. People have no right to do that. Next, we'll hear from a country musician who never gave up fighting for his granddaughter's access to the best medical care available. Look around you. We're surrounded by people who courageously face difficult obstacles life has thrown in their paths. Tune in each week to meet people who show there are positive, godly solutions to tough, critical situations. This Emmy Award-winning show tackles challenging life issues such as abortion, stem cell research, and adoption, and shows every human life is valuable and precious. Join us for inspiring stories of people facing life head on. Bobby Schindler is the brother of Terry Schiavo and the co-executive director of the Terry Schiavo Life and Hope Network. Since Terry's death, Bobby and his family have made it their mission to help families who are dealing with the trauma brain injuries bring. He's working to dispel the stigma that comes with brain injury patients and fight for their right to basic and continued care. Do you think that through your work, Bobby, with Terry's network, that you're seeing a trend in today's society to opt for abandoning patients, essentially, who seem in dire situation or is called hopeless? Let me, let me first say there's, there's uh, wonderful doctors and nurses and facilities out there uh, that, that I believe still look at life and, and, and look at life as having value and dignity, but it seems to me there's a growing ten where doctors are now making decisions whether someone should live or die based on their quality. More and more of them, it seems to me, are siding on, erring on the side of, of, of terminating life rather than uh, doing no harm and, and looking at all life as having sacred value and, and doing everything they can to, to care for that person. It's very popular right now to hear in the medical community the term persistent vegetative state. What's your opinion about that? Well, it's, it's really my, it's my hot button. It, uh, it, it does nothing but dehumanize the individual. Um, when, when you label someone a, a, as a vegetable, I, th I think right away uh, uh, people have a, um, um, they'll, they'll look at that person differently. Uh, I think it, it, it helps add to what I believe is just growing prejudice against those with brain injuries like my sister. I think even more dangerous is that they use this diagnosis, this persistent vegetative state diagnosis, as a criteria to kill people with brain injuries, as they did in my sister's case. I understand that as of late there's been some research and discoveries by the medical community that people in this so-called persistent vegetative state really have some awareness of the environment around them. Yeah, from the, the research studies that I have seen, uh, they are saying that uh, upwards of 50% 50 50 of people that are, that are believed to be in, in a persistent vegetative state are in fact not in a persistent vegetative state. 50%? Upwards of 50%. So they're saying uh, upwards of uh, half the people that they believe in a, are in a PVS or in reality not in a PVS. And when you look at that number, and then you look at it as, them, as doctors using that as a criteria to, to kill people, to terminate life because they're in this persistent vegetative state, uh, you can see why it's so dangerous. Colin Ray has been a staple in the country music industry for the past 20 years. With several number one hits, he's made a career of writing and performing while also finding time for his family. But Colin's personal life began to crumble when his first granddaughter began to suffer from an undiagnosable brain disorder. You had a very special first granddaughter yeah. by the name of Haley. Yeah. Tell me about her. Well, that's one of the one of the key moments of my life. And that was just an amazing experience, and but it it turned painful, so painful because, uh, but slowly, it was um, we, at two years old we thought she was fine. And then, then as three, she, her development started slowing down drastically, and it was like, oh, it's, something's not right. But then when Maddie was born, her sister, uh, Haley was four. They're four years difference. So in, in, in 2004, when Maddie was born, um, right after that, Haley really started spiraling downhill. I mean, she just got to where she didn't want to walk anymore, and she'd rather just sit on her knees. 
and we couldn't get her to walk and she, and she heard her speech had never been more than one word at a time. And that's, that's what we got used to. And, and we, it, we, we were concerned that she wasn't putting sentences together and things like that. But then all of a sudden that started going away down to just the one, she was losing the ability to do one word. It was just a downhill race downhill. It started going away fast. And over the next couple of years and, and on to the end of her life, um, it was never any good news. We never had a good, a moment of good news, ever. Did you ever receive a definitive diagnosis? Whatever she had was extremely rare. It was a, it was a degenerative brain thing. It was, her brain was actually getting smaller. The cerebellum was actually disintegrating slowly. Even though doctors could never diagnose Haley's disorder, Colin and Haley's parents never stopped seeking medical treatment. They didn't give up hope that an answer could be found. But Haley's condition worsened until one day her heart stopped at home. Though she was revived, Haley slipped into a coma. An MRI at the hospital showed her brain had shrunk by another third, making her family question if it was time to let her go. My daughter and, and Haley's dad, my, my former son-in-law, um, were starting to go, you know, Dad, I think, I, think, I think we need to let her go. And I was the one that kept fighting to keep her alive. We'll take her here, we'll take her there. I mean, every connection I had, any politician I knew, any, anyone, I mean, I was like, do you, do you have any strength at this hospital? Can you get me hooked up? You know, and we did all that and, and, and everyone tried the best they could. You know, I'm, I'm satisfied with that. The medical community that I had access to did the very, very best they could, but they were all just scratching her head and say, I, you know, and I think I finally, at that moment at the hospital in Dallas, I, I remember saying, all right, I'll, 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 I'll stop. And I felt this huge burden lift off of me. Um, and then the next day, they, they pulled the, pulled the uh, um, ventilator, respirator out. And she lived about another 35 minutes. And we watched her stop breathing, you know. When we return, we'll meet a soldier who's steadily recovering from an anoxic brain injury. Whether you're a student needing answers, a parent needing help, or a concerned citizen wanting to make a difference, Life Issues Institute has the resources you need to put your values into action. Life Issues Institute is an international educational organization committed to protecting innocent human life. Life Issues Institute knows what it takes. That's why millions throughout the world turn here for help. Life Issues Institute has authored more pro-life publications than any other entity in the world, and its materials are printed in over 30 languages. Radio broadcasts, newsletters, and a website filled to the brim with the answers you're looking for are just a click away. Go to FacingLife.tv and click on the link to Life Issues Institute to find out more about how you can change the heart of a nation. When Eric Edmondson decided to join the Army, his family was concerned, but also proud of his decision to serve our country. When he was deployed to Iraq in 2005, Eric left behind his wife Stephanie and their young daughter Gracie. Sadly, on October 2, 2005, Stephanie received a call all Army wives feared. It was like uh, 3 o'clock in the morning, and Stephanie called us and said that she had received the call and that uh, Eric had been involved in an IED explosion and that he was alive and had all of his limbs and that's all that she was told and that we would be hearing more later. We never got that call. So when did you find out the extent of the injuries? By that time he was in Balad and had had uh, some, um, a procedure done which ended up tickling his heart and he suffered a heart attack at that point and they worked on him for 30 minutes and that's where now he suffers from the anoxic brain injury. His initial injuries was a traumatic brain injury along with some other things but the anoxic brain injury has probably been the most devastating right now just because of the loss of the muscle tone and the language skills. 
Eric was finally flown to Walter Reed Hospital in Washington, D.C., but the prognosis wasn't good. He was in a coma and his heart wasn't functioning properly. Eric's entire body was swollen, making him hardly recognizable, and he was enduring multiple surgeries for his injuries. When Stephanie was finally able to see him, she was apprehensive about what to expect. It's a hard experience when you're young, isn't it, to deal with mm -hmm. that? Yep. How did you deal with it? Great family support and just, I think, the thing that come just to be there for Eric and to try to help him get better and do the best for him. An interesting thing happened uh, when Stephanie arrived in his room. Um, nobody knew exactly what level of anything was. <laughs> Um, but when, uh, so he was just pretty much laying there, <clears throat> staring at the ceiling. And, uh, but when Stephanie walked in, his monitor, as uh, soon as she came in and said something, his heart rate went up and set off his monitor. And, uh, so we knew that he was. You knew he was in there. We saw that as a We knew he, that was the first, as a family, that was our first clue that, uh, Eric's still there. We don't know where, but it was amazing. What was the doctor's prognosis back in those early days? It was, it was not, uh, it wasn't good. He, they just expected him to remain in a vegetative state and to be, you know, for us to be prepared to take care of him. Once stable, Eric was transferred to the VA hospital in Virginia. However, the medical staff was not prepared to care for somebody with Eric's injuries. As a result, he began to slowly deteriorate. So the Edmondsons decided to seek help elsewhere. It got to a point where they just, Eric wouldn't participate, didn't want to participate. He just, he just gave up. You know, it was quite obvious to us that's what was happening with him. And so they came to us and wanted us to allow them to put him in the nursing home unit at the hospital until he was willing or able to participate in therapies. You know, and when you sit there and watch your son in three months go downhill like that, now they want to move him to a nursing home, where do you think he's going to go from there? So we said, yeah. So we just basically told him we'll be here Monday morning, we're going to pick him up, we're taking him home. So we brought him home and uh, went on a search for some place for Eric to get, his, get some rehabilitation, somewhere positive. Mm -hmm who believed that, uh, you know, he could get a life back. And uh, somewhere that he was given a chance to rehabilitate, not just being taken care of. You were a man on a mission, weren't you? And Eric ended up going to the Rehabilitation Institute in Chicago, uh, which was, we considered to be the place that he needed to be. Eric and I went there for eight months while he was in acute rehab. It was an amazing thing to watch uh, what he went through, the transformation that this place did. What told you you were in the right place? It was a positive environment. It was, a, it was not a, uh, it was a, you were gonna get it done, you can do it, Eric, we were just, you know. A dietitian came in and said, Eric, next day, you're down for breakfast. So immediately, had him in a wheelchair the next morning, he's down, down in the dining hall with the other patients eating breakfast. And uh, it was the, just that, move forward attitude and that's what we were looking for that move forward attitude it was a new day oh it was amazing and it gave us great hope and uh he wanted his life back and he never gave up he learned there that he can do anything in his life anything he wants to do as long as he's able to work hard to do it and that's probably the best thing he learned there is just don't give up and uh we learned the lesson there that if he's willing to work hard <clears throat> to do this, then it's our jobs to see to it he's able to do that. Coming up, we'll hear about the importance of never giving up hope and allowing brain injured victims the opportunity to progress. Look around you. Every day, heroes abound in our country. We're surrounded by people who courageously face difficult obstacles life has thrown in their paths. Tune in each week to meet people who show there are positive, godly solutions to tough, critical situations. 
We'll tackle challenging life issues such as abortion, stem cell research, adoption and abstinence, and show that every human life is valuable and precious. Join us for inspiring stories of people facing life head on. In today's society, the term persistent vegetative state has become synonymous with hopelessness. But Bobby Schindler, Colin Ray, and the Edmondson family insist there's always hope. There's some in society who would say looking at people in a so-called vegetative state, just let them die, pull the plug, uh, don't let them suffer, and let's move on. What would you say to them? Uh, I hear all the time, who would want to live this way? Um, I mean, that, that always disturbs me because we don't know um, how we would, what we would want if we ever experience a brain injury. Uh, making a decision on how I feel now might change drastically if I ever experience some type of brain injury. I guess for me, you know, having seen other soldiers that could have been, that were in vegetative states that families might not have given them enough time or I think you should give the person enough time, you know, and opportunities and challenge them to get better. You can't just leave them in a bed and the day after they're injured say, okay, stop. I guess to me, the doctor's not God and he's kind of the one that 